I'm JT Takagi of Third World Newsreel. And uh, we're really glad that you were able to join us tonight for this film, Black Enough, and a talk with the animator and documentary filmmaker, Carrie Hawks. Um, tonight's screening and talk is being sponsored by Third World Newsreel, a progressive media center that prioritizes media by and about people of color, marginalized communities, and social justice issues. We do this through educational distribution, exhibition, and training. And I want to thank also our presenting partner, the Documentary Forum at CCNY, a documentary institute within the City College of New York that aims to connect the school in Harlem where the school resides and the world through the study and exhibition of documentary film. First though, I'd like you to join me in acknowledging that we are in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We honor all the indigenous nations and their land and acknowledge the genocide and continued displacement of indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and challenge the harm that continues to be inflicted upon indigenous and black peoples and people of color communities here and beyond, which is why Thermal Newsreel does the work that it does. And so on to the program. So I hope everyone is back now and that you were all able to watch the film. Um, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce to you the filmmaker and animated animator Carrie Hawks. Carrie will first talk to us about the making of the animated documentary Black Enough and then um, lead us through an animation planning exercise and if time permits show some other examples of, of their work. Carrie Hawks, whose pronouns are they them, is an multidisciplinary artist working in animation, drawing, collage, sculpture and performance. Their art confronts self-imposed and external assumptions about identity in order to promote to promote healing, particularly in relation to blackness, gender, and queer sexuality. Their film, Black Enough, has been nominated for a New York Emmy, won Best Documentary Short at Transstellar Film Festival, among many other awards, was broadcast on American Public Television's World Channel in 2019, and has screened at over 40 festivals and received generous support, support from the Jerome Foundation. They have performed with Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter, and participated in the Jerome at Carmargo residency in Cassis, France. They were selected for the Leslie Lohman Queer Artist Fellowship in 2018 and as a Jerome Foundation Artist Fellow in 2019. They are currently working on an animated documentary about BIPOC folks and self-injury, Inner Wound Real. Carrie also teaches at the New School. And so it gives me great pleasure to bring to you Carrie Hawks, who I'm first going to ask to start off by telling us about the process and the why of making of the film Black Enough. Hi, thanks, JT. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, you might recognize some familiar faces from the film. I won't say more. Um, yeah, so uh, Black Enough. Uh, so I made the film, I started working on the film a, a long time ago, but I made the film basically because I was struggling with my own issues of identity and belonging and being black enough for other people's standards. Um, and so during the process of making the film, I would say that how I started to like feel better about myself. And so the, the film was really to make me feel good about me. And then also looking into my family's history and how race was shaping a lot of our identities or and a lot of our feelings. So a lot of the conversations I had with my family in the film were the first time we had those conversations. And then learning a lot about my family's history also helped me feel um, more grounded and then eventually just getting to a place where I didn't put so much importance on other people's standards. Yeah. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the actual process though? Like, What yeah. made you decide to do animation as opposed to, because you have interviews with your family in the film, right. but you decided to use alternate methods. Yeah, so I, I chose animation because I, I first I started filming. I had some footage like with my mom, my dad, and then I realized I was going to talk about a lot of things that had happened in the past. Um, and to me, it would be more interesting to see to see them happen versus someone telling you what happened. And also because I am a visual artist, for me to like show it to you in the way that would give you more than just the background, but also the the thinking and the symbolism that I could bring in animation. 
um, and it let me create a whole world instead of um, using the world that we live in now. So, um, because I, I think animation is magic and you can do anything you want. You just have to be able to imagine it and then uh, figure it out. Um, so I um, never officially trained as an animator, but I did a lot of YouTube tutorials and a lot of um, other tutorials I found online in order to make that happen. Um, I always thought I, I would not be able to make an animated film by myself. It is a lot of work, but um, I was able to just kind of find resources out there and just keep working at it and keep making it. Um, so I would like to um, also share my screen and show you some of the, the nitty gritty behind the scenes process of it. Um, so I'm going to see, share screen here. Um, cool, and I'll put that present mode. So I hope everyone is seeing, hmm. Are you seeing uh, black enough slides? If you, someone could give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat. Okay. And it's got the whole Google stuff at the top, right? Okay. Yeah. I don't think I can get rid of that. But anyway, so um, when I was making the film, um, first off, I actually started by animating. I just went in and started. And then I was talking to a friend of mine who said, oh, you know, you should probably have a script. And I was like, all right, script. So I backed up and then I wrote a script for it. And even though um, I was dealing a lot with my own memories, but then also with my family's memories. So at that time I had some interviews with them. So I kind of knew what they might be saying. And so I was able to balance that between what I wanted to bring from my own stories. So those kind of melded together in the script and then going back and re-editing my family's interviews. I actually interviewed some of them three times because I knew what they were about to answer and then I could get like deeper into the questions. But for um, the visuals, like you'll see here, um, I started out just everything was sketches before I animated them and then I wanted to create a color palette for the film. So we had a lot of like muted tones and then when something really pivotal is going to happen. I, I had this accent palette. So that was kind of just like a guideline for me to figure out visually how the film would work together. And so you can see here, try to make this a little bigger. Um, some of this, like this is brushed work that I did uh, in a notebook. And then some of this is like a pencil drawing that I threw later. I went in and colored it in. So these are just like samples of what different things would look like and I really love texture. So this texture here, you can see like there's an African mask. That's a mix of some Photoshop brushes that I made after using watercolor and then scanning it and then making a brush out of it. And then this house here, I just drew it in my notebook and then I colored it in Photoshop. Um, so I basically um, laid out the whole film um, in these stills and it was kind of in between when I thought I was done making the storyboard and I thought I knew what the film was. So some of these don't actually make it in the final film because um, I animated the whole thing then I had an editor come in and fine cut it. Um, it used to be 26 minutes, 45 seconds. And then I had her trim it down to 20 and then we went back up to 22, 16 just cause there's things that I, I couldn't part with. Um, so the order of the film changed a little bit in there too. You can see my grandpa, um, he didn't make the cut, unfortunately. And it actually had a different beginning um, with like going through houses in my neighborhood, this part where I go to a, a slumber party and uh, they asked me if I carry a gun in my purse. That part didn't make it in. Um, uh, and then there's, I had different ways that I was gonna represent the people. So you can see here, uh, I wonder if I can make this any bigger. Um, I had different ways that I was going to have the characters. Um, so right down here where it has have a great summer, I thought I was, they were going to all be drawn that way. And then I mixed it with some watercolor. So the school bus is just a bus that I, in a notebook, drew. So it has everything kind of laid out. Um, I used to, used to be all the people were little triangle people because I was worried about um, rigging and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by rigging later but 
uh, having the characters have limbs, that was like beyond my skill set. But eventually I did learn how to do that. Um, I also had my hair and some, so some of these are like fill-ins for ideas of scenes that never made it in or made it in, but looked different. Um, so you have this scene here where I'm talking about self-harm, like originally that was going to be a lot more graphic. It is still pretty graphic. Um, and then the Negro hair petting zoo. And there you have my grandpa, he didn't make it in. Um, and different parts where I was gonna use a lot more photography of myself, but I decided that actually, you actually never see my face in the film, which is how I like it, because I don't necessarily like to be on camera, um, unless I'm talking like being silly or making fun of something. Uh, and then you have this Marilyn Manson part here. So a lot of these parts were like sketched out first to make sure that the story flowed um and then yeah you still have the little triangle people um and then i have this part where i was talking about costa rica and that actually got shortened a little bit um and then it got into the family section so you can see definitely in this section it's more like browns and ambers and softer tones warm tones and i wanted that section to feel like it belonged together so this was a way for me to plan that out before um, the final animation part. Um, also, um, some other parts that I was working through where you could see more of um, the pencils. Uh, like I was gonna have a real black woman section. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of ideas that I worked through and it was better for me to work it out on pencil and paper than to go in work it out, color it, animate it, and then I'd be really sad if it didn't make it in the film, which some of it didn't. Um, and then you get this Hammond's house section here and this little um, exchange with me and the fella and the fork um, that was originally drawn differently. Um, but then towards the end, I wanted to make the film look a little more cohesive. And so all of the characters ended up looking for the most part the same. Um, and then I have this part at the end of the Black Award and my ideas for that. And I was actually going to have the, the um, rules at the end, but workshopping this project with other people uh, made me realize that that might flow better at the beginning. Um, so that was another important part of um, making the film was getting a lot of feedback from different groups I was in. Um, I'm still in ladies animated short screening. It's open to all genders. Um, and it's a lot of animators working together because I, because I didn't have training in animation, I always felt like, I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't be making this. And so it was helpful to get input from other animators on how they approach it. And actually that whole screen layout was one of their ideas for like seeing how your story flows together. So it's an extended storyboard. Um, and then I would also like to show you a little bit of the nut and bolts for the animation part. Um, so I'm gonna oops, share my screen one more time and we will have uh, time for questions also. But let me open this. So can you see a character and a gray background? Thumbs up from anybody, Rachel? Yes, sweet. Okay, so Inside this program, I most of the animation was done in After Effects, which is my favorite program in the world. Um, and the character was built um, using a plugin called Rubber Hose. And so what that allows you to do is connect the whole body and kind of like a skeleton. So that's a rigging system. So um, I think I can show you here. If I want to move the wrist, I can move that up and down, it's a little buggy, but you can see when I move the wrist, the arm kind of adjusts a little bit. And if I move it in, the arm will eventually bend. And I've got this, so this is what, on the left, it shows you in the scene. And on the right, it shows me just the character. So it's very helpful for me to do one part of it at a time, because it's, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of layers here, but that's, there's actually even more layers, um, but I had to turn a lot of them off just so I could figure out um, how to move. 
So also like if we go to the ankle, um, we can scoot this up and then say, I wanna have it go ridiculously far, it can stretch. So that's one nice thing about animation is you don't have to follow all the laws of gravity if you don't want to. Um, then I think I'll show you the hips because that will show you how it, it moves the whole body. So it's broken the rig here a little bit, but you see how moving parts of the body will allow the other parts to move along with it. And so when you're, if you're animating a character, um, you'll probably use some kind of rigging system so that you don't have to animate each single part one at a time. Um, but if you're, if you were hand drawing this, then uh, it would take even more work. Um, but yeah, and so you can see the shoulder here and then the hand stuck out. Um, yeah. So maybe I will take a little break for questions about any, any of the technique or the process or uh, could be, yeah, After Effects 2020. Um, any I'll have one right off the bat. How long does it take to do each section then? Uh, I don't know. I will say <laughs> I started working on the film seven years before I finished working on the film. In between, I made another film and thankfully I have always had a full-time job. So um, it's it's been spread out. It's been a long process. And then even learning some rigging um, took time because that's not something I've done but before that. I have done other rigging since that. Um, and I've also learned like what I enjoy about animation and what I don't enjoy. <laughs> okay, so one question is, is this software also good for editing movies with real people? I would say no. I would say the best software for that is Premiere, um, which so when I made the film, um, I have like my still and my still graphics, my animations, and then my um, interviews. So I brought all of those into Premiere, which uh, Premiere Pro, which is part of Adobe Creative Suite. And that lets you do a lot more with sound because working with sound in After Effects is kind of a headache, um, but Premiere is really built for that. So that's where I did the final export everything from Premiere. So I imported my animations and my still drawings and then I had my like lower thirds and stuff in Premiere. Um, there's a person here who says, has a passion for animation art, but not sure where to start or how to get into the industry. How did you become acquainted with your animation friends? Well, um, I, first off, I went to a lot of events by this group here in the Northeast called ASIFA East. Um, ASIFA is some, French acronym, it's like animation, something, something, blah, blah, blah. I don't speak French, but they are a worldwide animation group and different parts, at least all of the world. But I know in America, there's Animation East, which is like New York, New Jersey, parts of Connecticut. There's Animate Asifa South Southeast, which I went to their screenings when I lived in Atlanta um, and they're all over the country. And then I, um, I met some animators there and then I talked to someone who was like, oh yeah, we have like a, basically like a critique group where they would come together once a month and talk about their projects and give people pointers on what to do. And that group is ladies animated short screening. But I would say it's extremely helpful to have other people because even if you don't necessarily, if they don't necessarily know what you're doing, it's helpful to be accountable to someone. And also when, you know, since animation takes forever, when you're like, oh, I should just give up, this is stupid, they'll be like, no, I've been there, you're not stupid, it's great, you can do it, or maybe cut out this part and then your film will actually be better. Um, so I, I think having uh, some kind of group, and right now like lots of things are virtual, um, that can be really supportive. Oh, someone put a CIFA East, or a CIFA South in there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, someone else is asking, uh, what made you decide to choose to spell the word enough as N-U-E-N-U-F? -E Just curious if there was um, meaning behind it. Yeah, that was kind of in reference and homage to Ntozake Shange's um, choreo 
poem play uh, for black girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is not enough. Um, and then I just, I like that, like, so people say I talk white a lot. Um, and that was kind of like, look, I can, I can also not. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I like the, the spelling and the, um, yeah. Um, I do have a question. Since you said you didn't have training in animation, that's like a huge step to decide, oh, I'm going to make an animated film. Mm -hmm. Like most of us would be too scared to even imagine it. So what do you think allowed you to take that big step? Well, I, I would say so. I started this film and originally I was going to make a whole film about everyone in my family. Um, and so I made actually my first animated documentary, Delilah, while I was making this film. And what I did for that, I, I went out to Washington where she lived and I interviewed her and I shot the footage and it's horribly shot because I don't know, I didn't know anything about lighting at the time. And so for that film, I did a type of animation called rotoscoping where basically you, you take footage and then you export, I think I did 12 frames per second and then I went in Photoshop and I drew over the frames. So that was kind of my cheating method to like trace. I was like, I know I can trace and I know I can work a lot. So I ended up making like 800 plus frames, but that was a way like, oh, okay. Well, if I did that, then maybe I can try this. But as also, if you'll notice in this film, there's no lip syncing, there's no mouse. Cause I was like, that's too much. I can't learn that much. But I mean, I, I probably could later, but I was just like, this is, this is already a, a bit much. Um, but yeah, I don't know, try things and fail. I think that's very good. Okay, um, so I have uh, some other questions here. Did you ever consider making your story a narrative film instead of a documentary? Um, I am very partial to documentary because there are so many so many things that happen in this world that seem like they could be made up, but sometimes it's just so rich you can't make it up. Like I remember one time I was in a bodega and some dude was trying to talk to me and he had earphones in, but they weren't they weren't plugged into anything. The the wire was just dangling, which made it scarier. <laughs> and I was like, I would have never even just thought about that, you know, just and this is before people had AirPods all the time, but I was just like, so you're listening to nothing. Okay. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of richness that comes from documentary and also when dealing with my family and learning things out about my family, it would have been like another layer to then fictionalize it, but I had them all sign releases. And then um, <laughs> I just thought it would be more vulnerable and more honest for me to do it this way. Um, I know for some folks, there's stories that they want to tell that it's probably, well, actually, we'll get into that later, but there's, there's many reasons you can do animation or narrative, but I just, um, I really love documentary filmmaking. Okay, um, someone asked that their si younger sister wants to be an animator, um, and I think she's 12. Uh, do you have tips that would be good for her? Yeah, I would say start. Also, it depends on what kind of animation you want to do, but stop motion is pretty accessible if you even just have a phone, um, access to a phone. There's an app called Stop Motion. Uh, it's like $5 on, uh, I think it's Android and iPhone, and then you can start making films with that. And because uh, they're only 12 and they grew up in the age of the internet, there's so much on the internet to figure that out, um, sometimes too much. But yeah, I, I would like find something that you think looks cool, but there's there's a lot of animation like stop motion or make flip books. There's a lot of things you can do even if you don't have access to like an expensive computer program. Yeah, someone just put in stop motion. Yeah, sweet. Okay, and then uh, someone asked, uh, I suspect you've been asked this before, but how did you arrive at the use of animation for documentary, which presumes problematically to present objective truth. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there really isn't a lot of objective. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to be objective, right? Because even if I made the whole film, just shot everything, 
I would edit it in a way that it would show you what I want you to see. So everything's already kind of not really objective and you have to consider, I consider what I want to tell you as an animator, what I want to tell you about my life. Um, I think some people see the film and they think they know me and I'm like, you know what I wanted you to see. Um, and then I think, uh, I mean, it's, I really just, I think also it's, it's easy for people to, um, empathize with an animated character or kind of get past a lot of things with an animated character, whereas they might have a hang up on, you know, how someone looks or what eye color they have or whatever in a real life character. So it just kind of lets you imagine more. And I think also animation, like in this film, I talk about self-harm a little bit. That's hard to watch, but it would be extremely hard to watch if it was a real person doing that. So I think it, animation also lets you cover more topics that people might not be able to watch otherwise. So another person asked, was it hard to ha for you to have some parts of the film cut out? Was there ever a time where you wanted a part to stay but knew it would be better to be removed? Um, yeah, so I worked with this great um, editor, Veronique Dumbe. Um, she's also a director and producer in her own right. Um, and I, when I brought the film to her, it was almost 27 minutes and I told her, make it 20. And then she did. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> like it, it physically hurt. So I think that's when I was like, okay, put this, this, and this back in. And then she, she kind of told me later, she's like, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, that by her pulling these things out, the things that really, really mattered to me were the ones that I would ask for her to bring back in. But if she pulled it out and I was kind of like, oh yeah, that doesn't work. Like it, it's still painful because I animated those sections and that was time. But I think it becomes a stronger and tighter story. And I'd rather someone be like, oh no, it was over too quick. than be like, oh, this part drags. Well, now we have a choice. It's um, seven o'clock. So if we wanted to do a um, group exercise, this might be the moment to do it, though there are still a few questions here. So do you want to finish the question to then go to the group exercise? Yeah, maybe we'll do five more minutes of questions and then the exercise. Okay. So um, there's question, one is projects you're working on right now or one that you want to do next. Someone else asked about the macro lens you mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, first question. So right now I'm working on an animated documentary called Inner Wound Real, and it's about three BIPOC, and BIPOC is Black, Indigenous. People of color. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and their experiences with self-harm, uh, because I touched on that a little bit in, in my film and my story, but that was another thing where I felt like, oh, I never see people of color talking about this. It's it's generally cis, white, able-bodied women or teenage girls, but it actually spans across every socioeconomic background, every race, every gender. Um, and I think there's a lot of stigma put on it. And I think that also keeps it more hidden. And I, I want to like combat that stigma and also for people to know um, like how to talk about it or maybe to be able to talk about it with people in their lives um yeah so that's my current comment. and uh the macro lens the macro lens i didn't realize i said macro lens but um i'm trying to find it i uh work very cheaply usually and i have somewhere so i'm in my studio also known as my bedroom um, but I'm not sure where I put it. I, so I shoot a lot on my phone. I just recently got a camera, um, but I got a macro lens. Sorry, there's some buffalo hair. Um, I'm trying to pull out my lens. I have this. It is a little, uh, here's the lens. Here's a little clip to put it on the iPhone. Um, and so that let me shoot some things. Nothing in that film was made using this macro lens, but that lets me shoot super close up with my phone. Um, I, like I said, I recently got like a, a Canon T7 something Rebel, Canon Rebel. 
Um, but I'm, I really love shooting on my phone because I can take it more places and not worry about it. Someone who uh, wants, well, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Um, and uh, someone asked how we could support your next film. Ooh, I mean, you could send me money on Venmo. <laughs> um, huh? Huh? And that's Carrie Hawks, um, H A W K S. Uh, and also just tell people about it. There is, um, I have a link on my website, maroonhorizon.com. That's for my graphic design work, my film work, my artwork. Um, there's a link on there for the project, um, and it gives a little description. I would say if you know places that it might screen well later, like I especially like to to reach a lot of youth, a lot of people who work with youth, a lot of teachers, a lot of counselors. So ultimately, I'd love to do screening workshops in at least 10 different places um, and work with a lot of people who work with youth because um, that tends to be where it starts to happen first. So um, you could reach out to me at blackenough.film at gmail.com and send me that info. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I think maybe this is a good moment to uh, bring people through an, this exercise that you were gonna lead. Yes, okay, I'm gonna pull that up one sec. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, so this part, this exercise, we're not going to draw unless you want extra, extra points and a non-valued point system. Um, but thinking about animation and thinking about the possibilities of animation, we're going to put folks into groups and pick one person to report back to the group later. But, um, I'd like you to focus on probably just the first two things here. Um, what are the advantages? Or, or what are advantages for showing or not showing actual people and places? So that that's kind of like reasoning behind why you might want to animate something or why you might want to use puppets or another method of storytelling beyond live action. And then the second and more, more if you're going to spend time on just one question, spend it on this. Um, what are places or beings that do not exist that you want to visualize or that you want to manifest? And so that's also another huge reason why you might want to animate something because maybe it does it's not real and you don't have a huge um, special effects crew to make it real. But if you have a pencil and paper, you can do it. Um, so I'm going to copy these questions and put them in the chat. Um, so when I break you out into groups. All right, so uh, I know that was short, but uh, we had to move it along. And uh, Carrie, if you would like to uh, lead us in a report back. Yeah, sure. I think um, my group, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting what we talked about for, um, reasons to use animation, but um, perhaps let's start with that question. Are, are there certain advantages that people see for using animation? I have a response if we're just going randomly. Mm -hmm. um, our group, one thing that our whole group said right, right off the bat is like issues of um, like safety or like anonymity, like any story where you uh, like can't necessarily like fully depict the people or the events uh, you can show with animation. We also, um, uh, one member of our group had a very specific example, which would be uh, like in the case of something like a courtroom or a space to which you would have no access. Yeah. Um, any other group answer that question? Also, yeah, those are really good. Uh, well, yeah, courtrooms, we see drawings on the news all the time of courtrooms, but um, 
yeah, anonymity is huge. Um, one thing that my group came up with is this places you don't have to physically be there, but we were like with a downfall for like people, like legality wise, it, does that person have to know that your character is them or can you be like, oh no, they're just really similar to you. Like, how do you go about that? Um, specifically for me, because I did it, that's, so that's one advantage of doing a narrative animation. You can just say these are, you know, people made up. But if you're doing a documentary animation, which I did, um, I mean, personally, I was like, there's a reason that I'm not going to name the school I went to just because I don't want any legal action. And I did have a lawyer look over the whole film um and let me know where she thought there might be any kind of legal issues um because a lot of people i talk about are dead and they're my family members that kind of let me uh talk about them but um i mean you could get into fair use where if you're making commentary or sorry commentary on something um that's considered fair use like definitely look more into that but there i mean there's a reason like if you're making art and you're making art for no money and you're not selling it, you're pretty liable to do whatever you want. Like somebody, like as, as soon as you start selling it or putting an ad or something, somebody might could sue you for defamation or something like that. I am not a lawyer, but um, yeah, I think there's, if you're just making something to share it out, you, you can, you know, you're pretty free. If you're living in a place where you're not gonna get, you know, imprisoned for that. Oh Lord. <laughs> Sorry, um, I have some students in China. I don't know. Oh, no, I hear you. Um, so our group, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, Carrie, um, this idea that you're not bound by the physical body when you're not using actual people, right? So you could actually make a person morph into a dragon, or you can, um, you don't have to be bound by the kind of gender identifiers or markers or binaries of the physical body. Um, so it, out, it enables a kind of escape of immediate judgment in a way that perhaps physical bodies might be immediately um, susceptible to. Yeah, I want to agree with that because I was kind of saying something similar where with animation, you can kind of give a better representation of how you may feel. It may be more accurate than how you look in terms of, I guess, what you're trying to communicate more whether the visual representation of someone is more important or how they actually feel or see themselves. Yeah, agreed. Um, sorry, I actually cannot multitask, so I won't try and do it anymore. Um, dude, that you kind of breached like the first and second questions, but did other groups also talk about um, the other question of, uh, what you might want to visualize that doesn't exist per se. I know our group, like we spoke about the privacy reasons and like legal reasons also, and like how you don't have to tie the story to like the person's physical aspects. And we also spoke about how you can also like manipulate the story into your own time and like your own setting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're like basically a god. You're just making it all happen. Yeah. Um, other groups? Yeah. Um, our group talked about, uh, well, for one example I gave was uh, something like a dream or like sort of like the most personal, like pure, uh, original, imaginative inventions. like. Sometimes, I, I, at least in my experience, like I've had like dreams or images in my head that like I probably couldn't even like conjure up the words to properly describe them. So, describe them. so even if I wanted to like have someone build it physically, I would probably have to like do an animation first for it to even make sense. Um, and then we also, one of our members gave a really cool specific example of a film. They saw they can't remember the name. Uh, but it was, uh, they were talking about a film that depicted like in Spanish Civil War. Um, it was like basically to broaden it, like it also applies to like very specific 
like times, places, memories, sort of things or people that existed that were very like, you don't have access to them because no one was documenting that, no one was recording it. Like that's another uh, really great thing that I think a lot of people want to like animate and create that way. Yeah, and I've, I've also seen that in painting, there's a, a painter, Fiorelli, I think it's Fiorelli Baez, she painted these two Haitian princesses that they were never drawn, their pictures were never taken. Um, she just read about them. And so like, there are no existing images. And so by creating them, it's kind of honoring their legacy also. And I've, I've seen animators do that too, where like there was, um, my friend made this animation about her gay aunt that she didn't realize was gay at the time. But just as a kid, like her aunt always had these friends that she would bring over. Um, and so she made an animation using Fisher Price toys that tells the story of her aunt. So not only does she bring us a visual that didn't exist, but we have a whole story that would have otherwise just been lost. So there, it's a great way to like continue history also. Um, any other groups or that had ideas? Uh, we talked about, and it's kind of on the same wavelength of a dream, but like emotions, like what would it mean to animate happiness, right? Um, for, because we can't really see that as people move about the world, uh, generally speaking, um, but you can animate a feeling coming out of someone or something to that effect. And we also talked about what would heaven or hell look like? Um, these kind of, you know, biblical um, or other spiritual spaces that you can't really see, right? Or like physically walk into. Um, but they can be animated into kind of a different type of reality. All right, there I go multitasking again. I should never do it. Um, <laughs> does anyone else uh, have other realities that they want to talk about or we can... Um... Someone was asking, is your friend's film about their aunt available to watch? Yes, that was what oh, yeah. I was okay. <laughs> multi <laughs> Her name is Chrissy Mahan. Um, uh, uh, her films are, sorry, it's going to sound weird, but if you Google Chrissy Mahan Dyke, because um, she makes documentaries, uh, you should be able to find a great picture of her. And then, oh, yeah, um, let's see. I'm going to put this in the chat. It's called My Aunt Mame. And it's it's really cute. It's really funny. And she's not someone who is also, she's not trained in animation. And she was just using her ca kitchen counter and Fisher Price toys and tape and just, you know, get the story out there. <laughs> Great. Is there any else, anyone else who wants to share from their groups? And or, or are there any final questions people have for Carrie? Oh, actually, I had one more thing that just came to mind that I think is worth sharing. Um, and it actually, it was sort of indirectly brought up by another member of my group. Um, uh, they, they also, they referred to a film that was about the Armenian genocide um, called uh, the Olive Merchant that was animated. And that one sort of brought to mind, and I forget, I saw a narrative film once that did this too, basically where uh, it was like a live action narrative film, but there was like one section where something happened that was like so extreme and like so intense that like showing it in person could have been uh, like very difficult or like almost unbearable. So the, the film like became an animation for that sequence. And I think that like that's been done before where like sometimes uh, people will depict like an extremely traumatic event or like an extremely brutal event, like in a, using animation in a way that sort of like frees them to do it in a more expressive way that isn't so like directly uh, traumatic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's especially good for that. There's, um, I think it's a Miyazaki film called The Fight of the, F sorry, I'm, this name's escaping me, but- oh, Grave, film, Grave of the Fireflies? Yeah, Grave of the Fireflies about um, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of other films that do that. I saw one about 
uh, abusive fishermen and I won't even get into what they cover but even in animation it was hard to watch but I know seeing it in live action I would just turn the camera off or the screen whatever so yeah it, it's, it's a way to get into some things in a slightly easier to digest manner I mentioned in, in my group that um, as somebody, I, I come from former Yugoslavia, so I lost my country as, as a teenager. And I often think about like what, like some kind of utopian version of what it could have been if we did not end up in this absolute dystopia. <laughs> um, and, and it's almost sort of like, I feel like it's almost, um, it's a very naive, perhaps, vision of like what could be, but I actually this motivated me to think of like if I could create something with the use of fairly simple animation to like create of like how like the better version of we what we could have been um, if we turn to the better versus turn towards the worse. So thank you for inspiring. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you for sharing that. I think there's a lot that um, I know other people have written about sci-fi in this, but like and sci-fi, activism, animation, same thing. Um, but really just like thinking of a possibility and allowing yourself to imagine and to dream is so powerful, whatever form you do it in, that it can actually bring you to something better. I had um, actually just listened to a podcast about the young, <clears throat> sorry, the young lords who are Puerto Rican activists here in New York City. And I didn't realize that before them, we didn't have a patient bill of rights, but they thought like, when you go to the hospital, you should know what your doctor's talking about. You should know what conditions you have. You should know what you might get into. And so they imagined that and they put it that into place. And now we have that and now it's real. So I think there's just a huge power in like letting yourself think of the better place that you want to get to in addition to calling out the things you don't like in this one. Great. I think, uh, I think we're about at that time. <laughs> so I wanna thank, thank you, Carrie, and thank you everyone for participating in this uh, the film screening, the talk, and this exercise in helping you to think about how you might also embark on using animation in your work. Um, thank you all for sticking through with us. And uh, thank you, Carrie, for being so generous with your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And everybody, um, we will have more events coming up, so stay tuned. If you're not on our mailing list, get on our mailing list. Um, the only thing I know for sure is that the, at the end of this month, we're showing Finding Krista, and we're going to have a talk about that film, the film by the um, great, late, great Camille Billups and uh, James V. Hatch. Um, so uh, join us then, but we'll have, we're setting up some other events in the meantime. So uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight, and, uh, and thank you, Carrie, again for a great talk. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank Hope you. Have a good night. Thank you.